I'm so sorry, but this song always reminds me of the pastor who preached against alcoholism and alcohol, and he said to his congregation, I wish I could throw all the alcohol in the river, and then the choir director announced, let's now sing, shall we gather at the river? So, um, let us bow our heads and, and let us pray. You are an amazing God. You are a God that calls your people together. You are a God that wants us to, to recognize that we need one another because we are family, brothers and sisters in Christ. We are not that many. It's a long weekend. Lots of people are gone on the road, but we are here because um, we love you. We are here because we want to be encouraged. We are here, O oh Lord, because we know we can't make it without your guidance. We also know, O oh Lord, that we have a huge responsibility as your children to grow and to know in our knowledge. Because the world out there needs us. And that's sometimes the hardest thing for us to realize is that we can't keep what we receive here for ourselves. But we now need to go and spread this when we are done here. This hope. This knowledge of God and who He is. So we come to worship You. We come to praise and acknowledge You. But we also come, O oh Lord, that, and to ask You to work in us. To do the God thing in our lives. You know what we brought with us as we entered this church. You know our stories. You know sometimes what makes it hard for us to hear you. I ask, Lord, that you will remove all those things today, that we may be able to hear your voice, but also the call to do and to be what you want us to be. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, because only through his name and in him we can be here, and we may ask these things. Amen. That essential question that all of us, and most people I think, should ask themselves probably frequently, why am I here? There are only actually two answers to this question. For the people who do not believe in God, and that's the sad thing, is that our country at this, po at this point are filled with people that do not believe in God anymore. The question or the answer to this question will be, will be somewhat different from ours. If you ask that person, why are you here? They will say to you, well, I'm not really sure. Because if you do not believe in God, then you, in a sense, must align yourself with the theory of evolution. And the theory of evolution tells us that a billion years ago, or billions and billions of years ago, the planet formed, the earth formed, it rained a lot. This huge pool eventually then developed, and then at some point, all the things that you needed was in this pool, and through a lightning strike or something cool that happened, Life just started to happen. So their answer will probably be, well, I'm an accident. Because it was through an accident that life sort of started. So what is the purpose of your life, you would ask this person, who do not believe in God? Well, my purpose in life is probably to do the best with what I've got. And what I've got is my years that are now given to me, or that I have in this world, from birth to end, so I need to grab and suck and, and then get everything out of it as much as I can so that my life can at least count for something. What will happen with you if you die? If you have this theory? Well, I will probably just be recycled into a plant or to a worm or an animal or something or be part of the cosmic energy. Somebody once answered me. Of course, there's a lot of energy in the cosmos, and I will just be a part of that energy and then probably live on in the energy of the cosmos. How depressing. How depressing. How bleak. How hopeless. And now we sometimes wonder why so many people are on antidepressants. Now, I know a lot of people really do struggle with depression. That's okay. But, you know, I read recently, and I think I've said this before, that that's the most common drug used in America. Because people can't make it anymore. They can't face it anymore. They are overwhelmed with life because they do not have a purpose. They don't understand who they are. And there's nothing that pulls you forward. If there's nothing that pulls you forward, 
then you only have the past and today to actually live for. And you are somewhat horribly stuck. I think that's the reason why so many people really then run to a little bottle to try to get a pill to make them feel at least a little bit better, but still bleakness, still a hopelessness. Why am I here? I do not know. Really? Maybe my parents wanted me. That's a short-term answer. Maybe because um, of something else I do not know. A person had lost. A person lost. The book of Revelation gives us, in a sense, the second answer that we know so well. The book of Revelation tells us that the only answer to your being lies in the Bible and lies in God, the God who created us and created the heavens. The book of Revelation is an amazing book, and this is my last sermon now on this for a bit, because we started, I think, last year in August with this book. And today is sort of the closure, then we are at the end of this amazing book. And what we discovered in this book is that God wants us to know that He's real, and God wants us to know that there's hope for us. But there's also something about the beginning and the end of you and me. And let's discover this. The, then the angel showed me the river of water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. You'll find this image also in Ezekiel. Not going to say too much about it today. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit. The 12 has to do with the 12 tribes in the Old Testament, the 12 apostles in the New Testament, actually that are the representatives of the church, old and new. So the church had all these crops that they produced. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face. His name will be on their foreheads. We found this also earlier in the book of Revelation, just mean that we are marked by God. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. A little bit further on in chapter 22. Look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am. The Alpha and the Omega, that's the first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. The first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs. Now, the reason why it's called dogs is because that was a really sort of a demeaning phrase during that time to speak of people that were totally godless. Dogs were seen at that point as, as not our cutie little things that lies on the pillow with a little ribbon in the air. The, they, they, were, they were really these wild things that were roaming the streets and they ate all kinds of nonsense and they were not fun to be around. Those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life, then come. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. The last word then in the book of Revelation and in the Bible. Amen. Mankind's story starts with a tree, starts with a garden, and starts with a river. You can read this in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. Humankind's story ends at the end with a city, with a river, and then also with a tree. But now lots of trees on each side then of this river. And what does this story want to tell us? What this wants to tell us is that there is the presence of God in all of this. 
the whole beginning of mankind and everything we know about ourselves started off with God letting us know, and I walked with them. How does it end at the end in heaven? God is with, with them, and they could see his face. Moses, he was sometimes a little bit like a brat. You know, he, he complained a lot, you know, and the Lord used him to do so many things. And at some point in, in, in Exodus um, 33, Moses says to the Lord, I, I want to see you. You know, this relationship where you are sort of missing and I can't touch you and see you, that's nonsense. I want to see you. The Lord said to Moses, you can't see me. No one alive as a human can see me and still be alive. What I'll do is I will come by, I'll, I'll cover you, so you won't see me really, but you will know that my presence was with you. And that happened. You see, it begins with the presence of God. It ends with the presence of God. Because that is what life is all about. The in-between, we have the brokenness. The in-between, here God started to walk with us. At the end, God wants to walk with us fully that we can see Him. But in-between, we have what we, have, what we broke. This is the problem for the world. The world will tell you, well, there can't be a God. Look at this world around there. And some people have said to me, well, if there is a God, he must be a horrible God because look what he's allowing to happen in this world. Look at all the pain, the suffering, the hardship that people go through. Poor kids having cancer, dying in hospitals. Do you want to tell me there's a God that's a loving God and all these things are happening? Blaming God for sin. We chose to walk away from God. He was present fully with Adam and Eve, and God said, do not touch that thing, because if you touch that thing, you are in a sense saying, you do not want to be with me. Now we can easily blame Adam and Eve and say, okay, they did this, but because they did this, in a sense, we are doing the same thing every day. Because every day, every one of us have that choice, am I going to walk with God or not? In between the beginning and the end story, all these stories of people that tried to do it by themselves, all these stories of people saying, well, I can show my neighbors that I don't need God. I can live a life without God. I can ignore God. And the sad thing is in our time, we have lots and lots of people that even are trying to do exactly the opposite of what God told them to do. Don't use my name in vain. And that's now the most common phrase, I think, in America. Oh, my God. Exactly what God said. Do not do. We do. Because maybe if you say this, you believe God is going to disappear. And you are proving the non-existence of God. But we know how these stories play out. We know that these stories play out sometimes very difficult and very hard for the people that are trying to dis, dis, dis Thou God and this no God. Do not want to know God. We know that that hardship and pain that most people experience in life is because of many choices that they have made. It's true that lots of things happened to us that we did not choose, but still, it's, it's not God. But what do you find between all these stories? It is as if all the stories that you find of mankind and in the Bible, that it's soaked in this unending, relentless love of God. God could have stepped away. God could have left us alone. God could have said, you try your own thing and I just am going to turn away and walk away. But this is, there is this relentless love of God where God constantly comes and says, I'm here. And what is it that God wants to offer mankind, wants to offer us? His presence. What is the most valuable thing you can give anyone? Yourself. Imagine now that a dad goes to Iraq on a tour for eight months. When he comes back, he sends his family or his son who's waiting for him a new bicycle because he's now going to have first go on vacation by himself somewhere. That's not what the son wants, a bicycle. What he wants is his dad. He's there to walk to the door and give him a hug and to be with him. The best thing that we can give is ourselves. How many times have you heard this? When soldiers are killed in battle, not killed, when soldiers are wounded in battle, many times they would cry out for their mothers. Mom, 
because that's the person you would like. God wants people to know his presence in its fullest. It's a place of incredible beauty. All these precious stones, precious stones that you will find in Revelation chapter 21 just tells us it's going to be awesome in the presence of God. His presence will light everything up around us. And it will be brilliant just to be with God. We will find the river of life there. God provides for everything. Here you and I need to work, work. And you and I, you and I need to do all kinds of stuff to be able to survive. God's always wanted to take care of us. Uh, when he created Adam and Eve, he said, you know, uh, here's the garden. I want you to, to be with me in this garden. They had to do a little bit of work. I think that was part of the command of, of life. But without tears, without sweat, without hardship, without cuts, bruises, and pain. Just to be in the presence of God doing great stuff. That is what the Lord wants us to experience. Um, I've said this a few times to parents. I said the best place for you to really connect with your child is when you do something with your child. And do something means sometimes to, to work in the garage or in the yard or some project or, or whatever, but just do something with your child because in that interaction, you discover a little bit of this child of yours and he will, or she will discover something of you. That's heaven. God is going to do stuff with us that we can, as we are in his presence, get to know him so much better and so much more. There's a tree of life, the gift of eternal life. I can't imagine that people believe that when they die, they are dead like a dog. Why can we love? Why, we, why can we have faith? Why can we interact on different levels with one another? We can create things. We exist uh, in a most amazing way, not only as body, but, but with our souls. And God says, I want, and I always gave you eternity. And this eternity not to be wasted, but an eternity to be with me and to spend with me. No darkness or brokenness, because we will be in the presence of God. In the beginning, you find a tree. But God says, do not touch. At the end, the last book in the Bible, you find a tree that everybody can touch. That's a tree of life. Eternal life. But then there's a third tree. You see, in almost every single of the last chapters of the book of Revelation, you will find this word, and the lamb is there. It was in the beginning, but especially here at the end. And the lamb is there. And the readers that read this letter as we did are now reminded of a third tree. This tree. You see, what now is needed for us is to go and touch a tree that is broken. A tree that is carved up and is now made in the form of a cross. A tree that, that is now one that's on Calvary. A tree of shame for the one that's on the tree, but the only tree that can give us access to the door to be able to touch the third tree, the, the tree of eternal life. And that's where most people fail to understand the story. They think, okay, cool, God created me, and God will give me heaven at the end, and I'm all fine. I just need to hang in there, and I'll get it, because I'm cool, and I'm cute. I'm awesome. And that's not true. Every time when the word lamb in the Bible comes forth, it tells us of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on this tree because we touched the wrong tree to have the right tree, eternal life. Therefore, the book of Revelation is a book of hope. It's a book that teaches us, or a letter that teaches us that there's really something that makes life worthwhile. It's a letter that tells us that without God, your life is bleak. Without God, your life is lonely. Without God, your life is, in a sense, useless and meaningless. Without God, you are a lost soul. Without God, you've got nothing to offer to anyone. Hugo Chavez's dad died this morning in Peru. He's there, luckily, by the grace of our Lord. I could send him an email when I, when I read this, and I could, in my email, give him hope in Christ. 
for his dad and for him and his family. What do you give to a child whose dad just died now? Not you're going to know about a child if they don't believe in God. I had this a while ago at a funeral. Somebody died. The people told me that this person that's part of this funeral, this, they don't believe, this family. And then this child is standing like eight years old. I can't say, hey, one day you'll be with your granddad in heaven. They don't believe in heaven. They don't believe in God. They've got nothing. The book of Revelation was written to a group of people in a time where lots of people were persecuted. It was a difficult time for the church. But they had to know that God cares, and that there's hope, and that there's an ending that's awesome, that drags you forward, that brings you forward. Then the invitation. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. The Lord called us because he invited you and me to come to him. That sentence says, and now we who heard need to say to others, come. It's our task. That's us. This is us. Our responsibility. The world out there don't know. They have no clue what they are missing. They have no clue how wonderful their life can be. They have no clue how much hope they can have and how much energy they can have and how, how, how cool things can be for them without knowing God. They don't have it. And we have the answer. And time and time again in this book of Revelation, we discover that God says, but I gave to you that you can bring it out and give it to others that they may also know. And therefore, you know this every single Sunday, I plead. Now, I ask of you, if you know anyone anywhere in some way, shape, or form, please just share with them something about your faith. If they ask you, what did you do for Memorial Day weekend? I went to church. And they will look at you maybe with a strange face. And then you can say, you know, because I really believe that there is a God. You may not believe the same, but, but I really do. And then you can walk away. That person may find you later on to maybe talk a little bit more. But just share something that they may know. The thirst. Did you see what it says? To thirst the living water. Let the one who is thirsty come, who wishes to take the gift of life and the water of life. That thirst is not, I, I, I need a sip of water because I'm now talking too much. Not this one. That thirst is to be really, really thirsty. Um, just a quick personal story. When we did our basic training when I was in the army in South Africa, um, we, ha we had a, a lieutenant that was, I think, not really, I don't know if he was always all there. I am not really sure. He actually committed suicide during the time we had our, our training a little bit later on. So he was really not, not that cool. Um, and they would have us run, you know, and do all these night marches and stuff. And he had this idea to help us get used to not drinking water. I, I, I can tell you it was like 90 degrees outside, and we worked out the whole day, and, and he would stood in, stand in front of us and would pour out water in front of us and say, well, you probably guys want this, but you're not going to get water today. And we had to wait till the next day before we could get water, and there was zero water where we were, nothing. You can't sleep at night because you're that thirsty. You would, I, I saw a, a big man cry because he was so thirsty because we couldn't get water. That guy was really, he was nuts. Um, that's the kind of thirst that the Bible talks about. That desire to see God. That desire to be with God. Let them who want to see me, let them come and be in my presence. I hope you thirst like you can thirst water. You thirst to be with God. Because God thirsts to be with you and with me. My second final slide. So why am I here? Because I'm on my way. That's my answer. You may think I'm somewhat lost, but I'm not. I know exactly where I'm going. I know where I'm going. My life is not defined by my past. 
My life is not defined by my present. My life is defined by my future. I've got a magnet in front of me that's pulling me forward, knowing that I'm moving towards the most wonderful thing that any human can experience, and that's to be in the full presence of the only holy living God. I have something that makes my life worthwhile because I'm going home. I'm going home. I, I can tell you this, all of you, I think at some point in your life, we're on a plane and you just wanted to get home. That's where you want to be, home. I've had enough of traveling. I had enough of all this stuff. I saw all these beautiful things in the world, but I now want to be home. That's, don't tell me my flight is delayed. If you want to see an angry person, home. That's where we're going. We are going home. And this is how this book ends. This book ends by saying to all of us sitting in the church, man, don't ever worry about who you are. You are a child of God. On your journey, you see God in His fullest, in His person, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And He's waiting for us. And when does this happen? Either with the second coming of Christ that can take place any moment or when you die. When you and I die before the second coming takes place, this, this is going to happen. Therefore, the people who believe in Christ who dies, there's a smile many times. There's this hope. There's this experience because they can already start to see the light of the one standing there waiting, a place with zero darkness because Christ is there, God is there, the Holy Spirit is there. How can we keep this for ourselves? How can we not share this? How can we not be excited about this hope? And therefore, children of Jesus Christ, church of God, man, let's go out of this place and let's go and share this hope to a world that is so hopeless, so dark, so at loss, for they do not have meaning because they do not have God. Amen.